Good morning everyone, welcome to the lab. Today, with a companion, we're going to talk about a very, very important topic. Today we're going to talk about defaulting. Something that even my dog knows how to do. And yet, immortal players in rank don't. So what is defaulting? Defaulting, I would call defaulting a position on attack that the team falls, falls back on to gather informations, to draw out utility, and to try to punish mistakes of the defenders. That requires a little bit more of a MOBA mindset and think about the map in a way that, for example, a Dota or League of Legends map is being built when you think about lanes. Because lanes are going to be crucial in executing a proper default strategy. And the goal of playing a default um, on any map is to get informations where concrete agents are playing. What kind of utility is being used by the opponents? Free, kind of to draw out that utility in case you need to be a little bit more patient with the execute to not get like naded and, and stuff. And fourth, that's, I would say, maybe third, is to get space, if possible. It's not something that will always happen, but you, if you think it's going to be able to do, then you can, you can get a little bit of space. And that space, we're going to talk a little bit about free maps here as examples. That space is something that I marked in yellow and in red. The space in yellow is the places on the map that you would like to get as an attacker's team that is playing default. It's, it's those positions that are beneficial to, for gathering information, for being more prepped to an ex uh, a, a actual execute later on the site. The red zones are the zones where there's, well, let's call it da danger zones. Danger zone! Let's call it danger zone. It, those zones you don't want to be at if you're playing a default. If you're in the danger zone as a default player, that means you overstepped your boundaries and there's a very high chance you're gonna get punished. And that's one of those, uh, one of those markings. This is bind, where you can see also the other locations on the map that are marked yellow or red. And you have also like positions where the red and yellow are together. And that requires then potential fighting for territory for the default players, right? We're going to talk about that as well. And here we have Split. And I think Split is a great, um, great map to discuss defaulting because not only we're getting this map back in a few days in the new episode, but also this map is mostly going to get a little bit of a rework. So we might then fall back to this video and make a new one and talk how the changes of the map affect the defaulting on it. So now let's... Let's talk a little bit about what we want to, to do here as an attacker, right? As an attacker, you want to divide the map into lanes. So we have lane number one, which is the garage on B. Lane number two, which is mid. And lane number three, which is the A, a side. Split is a very simple map when it comes to initial dividing uh, map into different, different areas. As you can see, one, two, three, right? When, for example, Haven is not going to be as easy because when we go to Haven, then we have... One, two, three, four, and five. There's like five lanes. And you have only the same amount of players, right? So the forces will be diluted because of that. You are going to have less utility for specific corners to be checked because there's more of them. And that's why Haven is such a complicated fucking map to play ranked. Because people don't understand how to gather space and information on so many lanes at the same time, while at, at the same time, this map is fantastic for a pop, for, a po <laughs> for pro play because of the same reasons, because it's more complicated. So the teams can be a little bit more um, creative into executing their strategies, can be also a little bit diluted, diluted on controlling the map, which allows the, the defenders to be a little bit more, let's say, freer in roaming, and vice versa, of course. So this is very important, right? Bind is completely different because it doesn't have a mid, but you have one, two, three, four lanes, right? And all of those are almost equally important, but not exactly, because on every map you're going to have also orbs, right? So uh, like, for example, lane one and four for defaulting on attack 
I would say is more vital than the other areas on the map because it's it's more contested, right? But also there's a bigger um, bigger award for gathering uh, that area. The same goes for uh, split. The areas on one and three are almost as important as on bind, but the thing is they don't gather you as much space because it's still far away from the site when you compare it, right? Look, the area one when the orb is in this spot and the orb is in this spot, right? Um, you don't get that much done when you're when you when you have control of yellow. It's still very far away from the um from the site. Well when you compare it to bind, yellow yellow areas apart from hookah are just literally next to the site. So you have a potential explosive uh, an explosive way of entering the site, but I digress. So anyway, the point is, when we play split on uh, as a default, we most likely gonna divide our um, our forces into one player per lane, right? Since split only has three lanes, we're gonna divide one player on B main, we're gonna divide one player on mid, and we're gonna divide one player on third lane on A side. And the same would apply to bind and haven, right? Let's keep to, to bind maybe, because you have four lanes. So you have one player on lane one, one player on lane two, one player on lane three, and one player on lane four. And then the rest of the players who are not assigned to a lane are going to be the flex players. That's how I like to call them, because they're going to be gathering the space and um, drawing out utility from the opponents because they don't have a specific job of holding angles. If you guys watched my previous episode about how, how players are ruining defense, right, by overpushing the boundaries, you can apply this knowledge now to, this, to those areas on the map, because as you can see, if a, if, a, if a defender goes into the yellow zone, then he has a, now he's in the danger zone, right? Now he's in a position where he can get easily punished. And a player who is just passively holding lane 1 or 3 and just be holding like this can easily punish this killjoy by overpushing and just get a free kill, which gathers space, right? And the killjoy essentially does a job by not doing anything, just holding a corner, right? But the more important now is how do we gather information and space by using the flex players? So the job of the player 1 and 3, let's, let's make an example, right? Killjoy and Viper... They're not going to do much. Their job is just to hold passively the corners and see if any opponent would like to overpeak, overstep the boundaries and punish those. And punish those um uh, punish those moments. Now, the free players on mid, they're going to use the combined forces in most likely clearing the yellow area, securing the yellow area, and also making sure that the players from the red areas from the danger zones are not going to be able to retaliate. So how do you achieve that? Think about it this way, as on, let's say, mid on, on, uh, on Ascent. You can smoke um, mail, then you have Boombot uh, for... Boombot for... Uh, for what was it called? Vents. Right? Boombot for vents. And because of that, you're able to gather a lot of space. When you do a pressure in mid, and you gather the yellow space, there's a very high chance that the players from A and B will make noise by over-rotating or by pushing into you. And that, that's where the info-gathering also is so important because now the players from lane 1 and 3 can know if there's already a rotation happening or they can gather space by pushing now because the players from mid, by doing pressure, are drawing out the players to help them and because of that, the player now on A can get her space. This is why the players typically on lane 3 in split are signed for Viper, because they can rely on their utility. When they, let's, let's use Viper here as an example on lane 3, right? When I'm playing Viper on lane 3 as a default player, I'm typically, typically relying on a Viper wall that essentially negates vision for the players that are defending on site, right? Because the player on site will not be able to see if someone is crossing into the yellow zone. The same goes from the red zone, from the danger zone, player will not know if someone crossed to the yellow, right? So, in this case, I can, after the pressure is being done on mid, I will be able to lurk a little bit if there's no one crossing, crossing his boundaries because of the utility that I have, right? And I can reposition because of that, then the later smoke, and let's say I gathered the space, and I have the control now of this area. 
Like, I'm still in the yellow. Do you guys remember how it looks on the minimap? That I shown? This is the yellow area. This is the... this. Those are my boundaries. But they're still in... Like, you know, they're not neutral. I'm not safe here. But I'm not overstepping my boundaries when I stay here, right? So when I have this location here, now I can communicate to my teammates who are gathering space on mid that now we can gather towards A because I already got some space. And the defaulting is successful because I gathered some space and people will be able to rotate to me, right? So in this case, the Killjoy can go towards mid and the players will either push into vents and help, help me to get kills on Heaven, right? Which is then supported by the Viper Wall that I set up from the beginning of the, um, of the round, like this. And we have a pincer move. Even though we didn't do much. We just gathered space on mid, which caused, caused a rotation from A players, which allowed me to be on the yellow zone on my lane, and then meet together with the rest of the team in the danger zone on Heaven A. While the Killjoy can just leave a bot or a turret for the flank, right, somewhere here, for example, and just control mid, because now she's the player that controls the mid lane and the first lane because of her utility. And now she will be able to respond accordingly to rotations and sounds, and she's the info gatherer after we made the initial push by defaulting. So this is very important to understand that at some point of the default, you have to act, but you need to know when is that moment. Because typically, in ranked, this will not actually happen. This is a realistic, um, this is a realistic scenario in a drilled team that understands goals that you want to achieve. But when it, when it comes to uh, when it comes to actual ranked, most of your defaulting will just fall back to oh, is someone overstepping the boundaries and dying or not. And that's also an issue because people are not using their utility to gather the space, to gather the info, and, be, and, and rely that info to the teammates to make sure that they understand what's going on on the map. That's why communications and Valorant are so important. That's why fighting as a team is so important even when defaulting, even when you're separated, right? For Bind, for example, players on lane 1, 2, and 3 are just very passive. The race can use the boom bot to clear hookah, get information. Maybe there's someone with a judge which goes also info that you want to avoid going into hookah later on and so on. While the players on, uh, on showers are actively gathering the, the space by using, for example, the sky flash, right? Whoops. The sky flash in this location. Uh, the smoke from Viper might be thrown. My God. The, the smoke from Viper might be thrown here as well to then gather the orb and secure the position in showers. And if they do that, because that was a default play and no one is overstepping the boundaries on one, two, and three, so the players from those lanes are not getting kills, the next call might be now we gather towards A. So three players are going short, those two players are waiting because they gathered the space, so they wait for the execute from short, and then they push out of showers while combining their forces with the team. And what is very important as well, in this case, the players from showers are not going first, typically. They are waiting for the pressure to be done from short because that frees up the potential crossfires and allows them to attack into the already then discovered players that are standing somewhere outside, maybe bench, maybe triple, and so on. And the thing is, again, this is from a successful default play, right? But in ranked, unfortunately, if you don't communicate, you cannot synchronize that. But still, defaulting, I think, is the most efficient way of playing ranked because, unfortunately, your opponents are just inting, feeding. Something that I talked about in the previous video, uh, in the 13th Flutter's Lab episode, when people are just over-peaking from hookah into yellow area and dying to the race that is just holding market, right? If you get a kill here, well then essentially you free up the entire space on, on, on the red area on, on lane 2 and allows that, and then that allows the other players from A side to rotate towards B and just execute, right? So, there's, there's, um... Defaulting creates pressure makes you, uh, but it's more about gathering the informations as well of what is happening from your, from your opponents, which utility they use, and then you can transfer that, those informations to your te to teammates, right? And 
unfortunately in, mo in most cases on, on, on ranked it just falls back on okay we got a kill because the player inted and now we have space because the other player didn't understand the boundaries I'm going to answer a question from the chat here. Does defaulting also result in creating pressure? Example, your explanation for shower space. So basically, you're more or less passive, but you create pressure? Yes. The thing is, and this is another example, when I'm playing showers, right? When I'm playing showers, I'm going to delete that we, what we have here because we don't need that right now. Um, when I'm playing showers alone, disregard whatever is, is here on the map, right? I'm playing showers alone as a default player. Let's put out the Yoru here because I'm a Yoru main, right? I have a few different approaches how I play default on showers. If I'm alone, I will typically just hold the angle like this. I'm just going to hold it to see if someone oversteps his boundaries, goes into my crosser, and I can punish him. As a Yoru player, I can also gather space in a more aggressive way by TPing into showers with a flash that bounces uh, from the backside of showers. Right? That's another way. But I typically won't do that, like the bounce from the flash over here, right? And then I TP in this area here, and I just attack the players that are in this in this box. But I typically won't do that unless there's the flex player coming with me to gather the space after I do that, right? Because he still needs to trade. If I just go alone there and just TP aggressively with the with the flash, create pressure and and try to like gather space on default, but I committed to the danger zone and I get killed, then I essentially inted my team. So that's the, that's the biggest problem of, of understanding that sometimes your characters can be aggressive, but there's an important distinct distinction between commitment and having a fallback plan. Because, for example, let's assume I'm again alone on showers, so I'm not going to go for the aggressive flash play uh, on showers, but what I will do instead I can be a little bit more aggressive. I can gather the space on yellow uh, in this area here, right? That we gathered before. This is also the danger zone because the opponents can also be here. But because of the design of the of the character, as a Yoru, I can set up a TP somewhere in the back. Where's the Yoru? Here we go. I can set up the TP somewhere here and then slowly go to check the corners in showers. So I go first here. I look if someone is in this corner because you're going to see his feet Right? If, you, if someone is standing in this corner and you're just hugging this wall and looking to the left, you're going to see someone's leg. So if there's no one there, I can slowly go here because I know no one crossed to the right side because I was holding default on this area. So I can risk a little bit more, hold this angle, then maybe dry peak or like jump peak, and then in case of danger, TP out backside and just try to gather the information. Right? But if there's no one here, I gathered the space for free. But I only did that because I'm able to dismiss from the danger zone, right? So, still, again, defaulting is more about having the idea of dividing the map into lanes, which then each lane gets a player uh, committed to one lane, right? Gathering information, holding the angles, and the flex player, so the player that is, like, uh, not, um, not committed to a lane can gather, with, can gather space with one of the players, and that's very important that to understand. Most likely, you don't want to push in all of the lanes at the same time to gather the yellow space. Only, typically, I would assume, I would at least coach a team in a way that you want to gather the yellow space only from one lane because that's where the flex player will go to, right? And for example, if, if I'm going to gather space on A main, great way of doing that is a dark cover being used like this because of this... Because this dark cover essentially negates the informations for the players from, from A long and from short if someone is crossing into the lobby and then we can go from here. We can either go to short to the yellow zone or we can use another piece of utility to attack long and then try to, as in showers and bind, and logically gather the space on the danger zone and the yellow zone at the same time, right? But dur during the moment when the team does that, when the Omen and Sova so the flex play here, they try to gather the space on A. The players on the other lanes, they cannot overstep their boundaries. They have to be more passive. They have to try to gather informations, play of the of the information that the opponents are using um, or giving them. And also, what is very important is they just cannot push into the red zones. Because if they do, 
are most likely just gonna die, and then the players from A, from the lane 4 and 5, will not achieve anything. Hopefully this was helpful. I think there's, there's many more things that you can talk about at default, and I probably just drifted away a little bit in all of those explanations, but this is not scripted, so hopefully it's going to help you a little bit understanding defaulting and what are you trying to achieve with a default. Um, but yeah, one more tip. If you don't have smokes in your team, right, your best bet on attack is to actually play heavy default that relies on punishing overstep uh, by, by uh, the opponents overstepping their boundaries. If I don't have smokes on Haven, which is pretty fucked, right? It's still winnable. You just have to play more passively and waste maybe like 40, 50 seconds because team, like the opponents will get restless and they might actually push into you and just get punished because of that. And that's how you free up space that you otherwise will have to push onto a side on a full execute with no smokes, no vision blocks, and you're going to get just ultimately punished. So hopefully you learn from this. If you don't have smokes, don't worry about it. Rely on heavily passive defaulting. But if you have full utility kits, well, then you can be more active, as I just explained. Thank you for watching. Share this video with your teammate who doesn't know who, what defaulting is. And see you guys in the next episode.